uh, your interest, interest and publications have included clinical applications in child hyperactivity, food additives, hallucinations, and most importantly, the effects of child adversity. But I think for me, the introduction about you and uh, Dave's uh, partner, Fiona, is also here, is that for the last 12 years, or almost 13, 12 years, they have come every year for at least two months to spend time and volunteer with Dream a Dream. For the last 12 years, they have supported us in deepening our understanding of child development, child adversity, and the impact of that on learning. Tomorrow, you will also get to hear from them on the scale that we were able to be developed together on how we can assess life skills and the ability to thrive. So I think that for me is the more important introduction, that you have been such a long time supporter, friend, volunteer, and really a part of Dream a Dream for so long now. Thank you. So now we have the difficult task, actually, of bringing this day together, all the things that we've heard, all these pieces that might seem a bit disconnected. How do we bring that together? So I have a question. I will start with a question. It's slightly long. But we heard in the morning about the 100-year gap, and we also understood, and we really understood the urgency and the need with which to leapfrog. That was what we explored in the morning. And from Guy, we really learned about how so much, right, who we are is also, that the body is such a big part of who we are. Do we truly acknowledge that? Do we truly celebrate that? Do we understand that? So now we will push this conversation forward. We also did our own exploration of our body and our memories. So to push this conversation forward, I really now want to go into the question of what does this mean for our children? What does this mean for the children at Dream a Dream? What does it mean for the children that all of us in this room are working with, working for, and uh, yeah, who we come across in our day-to-day -day work lives, in our day-to-day -day life? What does this mean for for them. So my question, Dave, is that that we all know. I mean, I think again, it's it's quite well understood that when chi that children coming from adversity are not starting at the same place as a child who might be coming, say, from a mainstream school or say, elite public school or you know, just a mainstream. I'm going to call it mainstream. That children who are coming from vulnerable backgrounds, who are coming from poor socioeconomic backgrounds, who are coming from early experiences or childhood experiences of adversity are not starting at the same place. I think this is also quite understood. And mostly we understand this as a challenge of access. Maybe money is a challenge, why you're not able to get access. Quality is a challenge. The access that you're getting to is not of the quality that a child from a mainstream school might get. It could be infrastructure, it could be your support system. So we get that, that it's, there's also the issue of access and quality. <clears throat> but what we have learned from, uh, from you over these years is that when children come from adversity, they are also psychologically, really internally, also not starting at the same place. While externally they are not starting at the same place, there's also internal psychologically where they are not starting at the same place. <laughs> So, Dave, could you tell us a little bit about okay, that? Okay, thank you. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction, and it's lovely to be here. B before I start, I'd like to speak to the young people just here in this group here. Today we're talking about problems. We're talking about challenges. Now, I'm sure you've felt a lot of these challenges, and I'm sure when we talk about damage, you're going to think, well, is, is that me? Um, have I been through that? Have I come out the other end? There are actually two stories. But one is the damage that happened to adversity. And the other story is managing to get through it and come out the other end. Now, you're all an example of coming out the other end. So what we're going to talk about today is that challenge that you've been through that I guess you're going to recognize a lot of it. Tomorrow, we're going to talk much more about success. So it's quite difficult sitting here just at the moment talking about damage and difficulty as you listen. But I guess you're going to recognize a lot of that. And you are the successes that show that you can overcome these things. So we need to hold on to that at the same time. 
So I wanted to sort of say that before we start. Um, the question is really, adversity and what does it do to children? And why is it important for us? What we do know is that adversity damages development. We know that if children suffer adversity, if it's severe adversity, they stop growing. Now, for all the teachers here, um, who, who are teachers? Can I just ask? Okay. Um, who are working in child systems? Probably most people. Yeah? Okay. Have we got any politicians? Oh. So we can say whatever we want, can't we now? That's good. <laughs> okay. For those of you that work with children, for those of you that are teachers, imagine a scenario. Imagine a very, very expensive international school. It's in the middle of Bangalore, it's in the mid middle of Mumbai, somewhere like that. I don't know how much you pay for an expensive international school, but I think it's lots and lots of rupees. Now imagine the children coming out of that school. Just picture them in your mind. Maybe they're 12, maybe they're 13, maybe they're 14, that, that sort of age. At the same time, Imagine a group of children coming out of a shelter school or something similar to that. Now I'm guessing, for all of you that work with children, if we put those children in the same clothes, put them in the same uniform, you would still know which group is which. You would simply look at them, wouldn't you? You'd look at them and say, that group are the expensive international school children, that group have come from the shelter school. When we stop and think about that, when we think about why we can tell that difference, there are a number of things that go through our minds. We would notice, first of all, that the children from the shelter school, and that's probably the children that you're all working with, those sorts of children, are quite a bit smaller than the international school children. As a part of research, we had to get two groups of children together to make a comparison when we're developing the scale that you'll hear about tomorrow if you come to that session. We had a group from a private school, an expensive private school, a group from uh, a shelter school. We put them together for a football match and we had one team like that and one team like that. And actually, they were all the same ages. So we know, first of all, that adversity affects children biologically. Going on from what Guy was saying, bodies are different. Children who have suffered adversity, who have been through adversity, have different bodies. That doesn't mean you can't recover, and we need to keep, keep that for tomorrow. The most noticeable effect you'll see are children who have not had enough to eat. Their nutrition has not been good enough. When children not had enough to eat, or their nutrition is not good enough, they become stunted. You know what I mean by that? You know, the children are quite small, and they're, they're probably a lot smaller than they should be. Now, the government of India, the official statistics, and it's a shame we haven't got a politician here today, because we could have pinned them down. The government of India is saying that approximately between 45 and 48% of children are stunted in India. Roughly, that's half, isn't it? Give or take, that's half. <clears throat> so we know adversity is affecting at least half of the children that you work with. And that's a very conservative figure. It, it's a lot higher than that, obviously. Children that, serve, that uh, experience adversity, whether it's nutritional, whether it's psychological, whether it's emotional, if it's severe adversity, that child will stop growing. They will grow very, very slowly. It's not just about food. Food is the most predominant thing that we see. That's not the only thing. If we change language, and we swap now from education to child health, we'd use a different set of words. 
I have never worked in a school, and I don't work in a school. So you may wonder why I'm up here talking to you. The reason we're having this conversation is that child health, child well-being, and education have to go together like that. And if it doesn't, there are all sorts of problems that can be generated from that. So for children who are stunted, who are not as tall as they should be, if you change that to child health, that's known as failure to thrive. It's a formal diagnosis. It's a diagnosis used throughout pediatrics throughout the world. And it's quite nice in a way that the term failure to thrive is joining in to what we want to do, which is to make children thrive. So already we're getting a hint that adversity is stopping children from thriving. Failure to thrive is quite simply a measurement on a growth chart. I'm not sure whether you, you have growth charts. Has anyone got a growth chart? Yeah, for their, maybe for their own children or, yeah? I noticed during the, um, during the week we went to friends and they have two four-year-olds. One had a chesty cough. We went to the pediatrician about the chesty cough and came away with a growth chart as part of the letter telling the parents what was wrong. Growth charts are really very important, and we'll come on to those in a minute. So we have a situation where children who have been through adversity are shorter, generally, as a group, than children who have not. That's not to say there are not short children in all groups, but there are far too many in the group that have been through adversity. So then we ask the question, well, why does that matter? Why does it matter if the children that you're all working with are rather shorter than other children? So what? Does it matter? The reason that it matters is that there's a basket of problems that come with that. Now, failure to thrive became a diagnosis in pediatrics, in child health, around about 1860. This isn't a new phenomenon. So for a long, long time, it's been realized that children need to grow at a certain rate at a certain time. If that doesn't happen, there's a basket of problems that those children have. And those problems, I'm thinking, you will see in the classrooms. And I think if I describe them, if you could visualize the children you work with, I'm sure you can visualize these sorts of problems. So children who are not thriving, children who are stunted, have a list of problems. And the list starts off with poor cognitive abilities. Now, if we unpack that a bit, what does it mean? What it means is that children who have been through adversity do not have such good memory systems as children who have not been through adversity. They do not have information processing levels that they should have. They don't have memory problems that they should, sorry, they don't have memory abilities that they should have. So in the classroom, what that means is children who have been through adversity, and don't forget we're talking about over half of the children in India, and when you take out the children who are in expensive schools and other schools, the ones that you're working with, it's much more than half by the time you, you, you level this up. Those children cannot reach their cognitive capacity unless something happens. Now, we have a testament here about something happening in front of us. So it's not total doom and gloom. But we know that children who are stunted, who are failing to thrive, who have been through adversity, do not have the cognitive capacity that they should have. So we need to move away from intelligence. I'm trying not to use the word intelligence in this at all. But those children will not be able to do as well in the classroom as other children. And I'm sure you've seen this, and when we talk to teachers, quite often teachers say, you teach, you teach, you teach, and yet the children don't seem to learn especially the children who have been through adversity. So why is that? Well, the, the answer is neurological. There's some neurological issues that are going on, and this sort of follows on from what Guy was saying, that are stopping 
that ability, stopping that capacity from being reached. If you have poor memory abilities, that means you can't take in information and process it and keep it. That means information is not going in as it should do. It also means that that child cannot follow instructions as well as they should do. You find with children who have been through adversity are given instructions of something like go over there, go to the cupboard, open the cupboard, get the pencils out of the box and bring them back here. And for some reason, teachers say, do you know, I say that, and they get halfway through this process and they don't know what they're doing. I mean, what is the point of me telling them what to do? So what's happening there is this neurological issue of adversity impacting on the classroom. Children who have been through adversity often have relationship problems. That means relationship problems both with their friends, with people around them, people in the classroom, and with teachers. If you have a child who's unable to form the correct sort of relationships for that child's age, you'll have severe problems in the classroom. You'll be teaching 10-year-olds whilst using an 8-year-old method of teaching, if you like. The relationship between the child, the classroom, and the teachers is somehow wrong. Allied to that, what tends to happen is that children who have collapsed in terms of development. So you have a class full of 12-year-olds. You do something that's slightly stressful, like whether they start an exam now or something like that. And you've suddenly got half these children are acting like 10-year-olds. A few of them are acting like 8-year-olds. Suddenly your capacity for the teacher is difficult to carry on teaching. Your capacity in programs are difficult. So these, these children have a number of issues that we need to take account of. I think I would slightly disagree. I'm on difficult ground here. I slightly disagree with Rebecca on your 100-year gap. Um, I'm not disagreeing over the 100-year gap. My concern is if children who have been through adversity do not reach their capacity, bearing in mind that's probably at least two-thirds of the children in your classes, if they then have access to education, and if that education is superb, they still cannot access it. Those children cannot access what you're giving them. And you hear this so often from teachers that, you know, when we work with these children, we just cannot quite get to their capacity. The second story, which we're looking at tomorrow, is capacity can be reached, and you're our testament to that here. But the, these issues of capacity and damage have been about now in text for at least 150 years. There are thousands of research studies. They're, they're counted here. On the flip side, does adversity do something good to the kids as well? Yeah, um, yeah. Because, so, I speak from my personal experience. One of my kids is adopted at a fairly advanced stage, uh, age, I mean, sorry. And, and we've been observing her for the last two, three years. Um, th there are parts of her which absolutely delight her. Mm. Um, uh, and, and as knives, uh, we probably think that it, all of it has come from the adversity that she has faced yeah. in her early life. Yeah. Uh, so that's one question that I want really? to leave with you. Uh, and, and the second one is a simpler one, which is uh, the stunting 
Does this lead to some reduction in your physical abilities as well? You, you spoke a lot about cog cognitive and mental abilities, mm. but does stunting lead to any uh, reduction in the physical abilities as well? I mean, uh, to, 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 to some extent, because bodies are smaller, um, yeah, but, but, but actually not to a great extent. No. Yeah, I mean, in terms of agility, in terms of ability, athletic ability in general, the, the kids are as agile and as fast and probably as have as much stamina or probably mm. more than those yes. who might not. In fact, what you will find is not only uh, as much stamina, too much stamina, because the controls that they should have developmentally have not happened. They are quite difficult to get them to sit down, keep still, and in a class. So stamina-wise, they're bouncing about all, all over the place, and that sort of fits in with what Guy was saying. You, you know, it is very difficult to get them to sit down and concentrate because concentration is more difficult. So on the one hand, yes, I mean, we have a testament here, you can overcome these issues, but unless you do overcome them, they won't overcome themselves. You know, you, you have to overcome them. If you do not say, these children need something more, they need more resilience so I can help them to reach their capacity, they won't reach them by themselves. One No, they can't. No. Yes. Okay? Yeah. In debate, they do better. In dancing, they do better. So I just don't agree because all our experience counters this. And also there's been a lot of research in the last 30 years and more that has countered all this. It's a very old uh, system. I mean, and uh, it places a view and almost gives people a cop-out to have different systems for different kinds of people and often watering it down mm. for them. I think if you go to the average government school, they will not be two grades higher. Can I think I if you go to an average rural school and match them with Berkeley, they will not be two grades higher. Your, your children are... No, no, no. I'm talking about children from a rural background. Sir. Sure. Urvashi, I, I hear no. you. You're saying that the deficit view is really countered and there's research mm. to counter it. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that you disagree with that. Yeah, see, we find uh, children are so arrogant nowadays. But uh, we don't know who we were. We think we are we were good at that time. We are not so arrogant. Many of the parents would uh, agree with me. Nowadays, children are so arrogant and I uh, mix uh, my question with his uh, question. How can we uh, make these children to change their attitude? Since you are a psychologist, in, please mm. guide the uh, teachers or some other persons who are here. So that uh, these uh, less arrogant children might be more useful in uh, getting educated. Sure. So you want to know what we can do when we have arrogant children or disruptive behaviors, what can we do? Great. So that's one question. And your question was, does adversity also have a positive impact? I'm going to hold these two questions. Are there other questions about it? Uh, there was. Any?
poverty is uh, i really wonder how it is counted it's comparison it is a relative thing when we compare with rich people are the things having more more things having people we feel poor so the adequate things uh, cannot give any more uh, strength i think if the lack of things also we if we are satisfied with the things what we are having i don't feel we are all poor or all nothing so it is the state of psychology poor or rich so for a state so, of state of mind that's why yes just, just <laughs> it is only the state of mind yeah. poor or rich is the state of mind sure. nothing apart from this okay. if i compare with uh, richer than me i feel poor <coughs> if i compare with uh, poorer than me i feel rich yeah. so instead of focusing to the things what we are having so why can't we focus how to succeed what we are having along with the things what we are having yeah so it is ha what we are having so we should succeed and uh, another one question is in mind my mind why the education is being connected with earning money uh, and why the education is uh, educationist is thinking about the schooling only schooling education takes place everywhere not only in the school in every aspect every corner by doing many works also we learn many skills life skills assisting to the mother father family work we learn lot of skills so we learn there also education will takes place everywhere in the every corner yes. and we are only concentrating to the curriculum yes. government policies yes. why can't we think to break all these things is there any restriction not to read apart from the curriculum no if the curriculum is old if the curriculum is uh, are not updated we should have freedom to see the world there is no restriction so yeah that's so that's why yeah instead of uh, what time what is my view uh we are uh, only thinking of problems 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 i it creates some yeah. some uh, barrier to the young ones yes. so many great people achieved with the problems yes. when chanakya was just a simple poor man brahmin and uh, he thought to defeat nanda he was the great king in india he was having nothing he built an army Sure. so, so that's why focus on problems ha ah, the yeah. things he was having nothing yeah. just he was having determination to do if we are having the determination to do so no need of anything nothing will prevent us we can do why should not think in this way that's my question was there a question here so it is you had a question but i appreciate your comment that education is not just in the classroom education happens everywhere and that if you keep looking at problems they come as a barrier to actually achieving something thank you i'd want to go and leave this time uh, if you really want to take answers because this is more of a experience sharing do you sure. want me to go okay uh, so this is more tying uh, ma'am's point where uh, yeah urvashi uh, ma'am's point uh, uh, the bit that i believe because um, i think uh, many a times i uh, completely agree on requirement of mi- mindfulness requirement of mental health but if you look back at our education system it has also done quite a f- bit of right and it is important to look at those right examples and what drove them being them here also and i do not think it is necessarily mindfulness or uh, uh, the the way we define mindfulness in terms of let's say uh, spiritual understanding or body understanding or things like that it it is defined more in terms of a fear sense of responsibility that i must do this and i must achieve this i was speaking to many of them this is what drives them this is what drove me this is what drives many a people and many examples of high morality high nature connect i mean people who are connected with nature 
a fierce sense of responsibility. So while I understand that mental health is necessary, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, I do not think the strategies that are being talked about in terms of, I don't know, yoga or in terms of uh, uh, any, any other things that have been mentioned really drives up this fierce sense of responsibility. The fierce response, uh, sense of responsibility gets driven up by experience. So that's something which will urge people to think about that people who come from adversity are driven by that adversity. And this is something which we must acknowledge and probably uh, you know, leverage upon in terms of getting. So that's a personal experience that I would want to share because this is how I've seen it. So you're it. saying that when I come from adversity, it drives my responsibility, it makes it more? That could be, and also if we are taking out to a larger scale, I mean, I'm going to take a simple example. Uh, I believe that uh, introduction of a lot of elements which improve mindfulness as a classroom activity kind of externalizes the problem. Instead, if I can make the child go through experiences of scarce living, minimal living, it will make the person realize a lot more. That's just a small example of how you would go about making a child realize what is important in life and what is not, how you should have responsibility sure, towards absolutely. it. Absolutely. So we need experiences to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Uh, one of the things I heard was more about stunting leading to adversity and in early years, so right now the government is trying to do a lot on nutrition but apart from that there are other issues in early years at homes mm -hmm. uh, in terms of safe en environments and other things at home, uh, violence at homes, you know, issues related to cars, etc. So in your experience what are these other things and we do in earlier years. So right now there's one set which is we take action later and try and bridge the gap. But what are these actions that we can take apart from nutrition, improving nutrition, in early years that can help bridge this? Yeah, uh, yeah. can I rephrase that though, Arjun, in case you don't mind? Yes. Nutrition is one reason why stunting happens. Yes. So if, I can, if we can stay with the question, are there other reasons why stunting happens? So then we'll know what we can do to counter them. So do you mind if I ask that yeah, so question? Apart from stunting also, there might be other things that the child is not stunted. Mm. Is the so, three-year-old not stunted yeah. but is seeing violence at home. Yes. That is also adversity. Yes. Yeah. So what absolutely. are those things, factors, apart from yes, that? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, the, the whole body exercise was also about so much of these adverse memories are in our bodies, right? They're really just there. And unless we've done something uh, to heal it or process it, they, they just stay in our body. So I think I, uh, so let me take that question that other than uh, nutrition and or rather other than stunting, what are the other challenges? Okay. Like what is yeah. adversity and how does that impact learning and child development? If I take that on two, two levels, the first level is if you look at failure to thrive stunting, you have organic failure to thrive and non-organic failure to thrive. Now, we can transfer that into a different language. We don't have to use those, those words. But what it means is that one type of failure to thrive is due to nutrition or disease, and the other type isn't. If adversity is great, now, whether that's violence at home, whether it's abuse, that stunting process will still happen. If it's not so great, then you can't see it. That it's almost as damaging if not as damaging, but you actually can't see it. And I think what you're saying is there are many, many things you just cannot see. We, we, we know that adversity covers such a wide area of things. We only started on stunting. If we had a whole day today, we, we could go through hundreds of different types of adversity. The very common ones are, are things like being abandoned, institutional care, living in war zones. All those sorts of things are huge amounts of adversity for children. We also know something else, which I think is joining on to what you're saying, and I'm thinking it's where you're coming from, is that those experiences are very, very damaging. What we do know through research throughout the whole of the world, so every country in the world, the greatest contribution to mental health issues in adulthood is adversity in childhood. Now, that, that is in every country in the world and almost every type of mental health issue. It's so powerful. And I think one of our jobs 
is to get children, if we can, to first of all um, understand their story, what happened to them, understand that it wasn't their fault, get them to own their story. This is my story, and I'm proud of it. It's not as good as your story, or it's not the story I wanted, but I'm proud of it, and then accept it. And that process is one of the most powerful ways of counteracting later mental health. Now, if we don't do that with children now who have suffered from adversity, we're effectively saying, we don't mind if you have a lifetime of mental health issues. And so the sorts of issues that you're talking about are enormously powerful. It's not just about nutrition. It's not just about stunting. The, the whole thing, if we had time, it would be like a bundle. We could unpick it. Little piece. If you had two days, you can pick the whole thing and have a much greater understanding of it. One last question before we close. Yes, from Anna. Um, picking up on the, the threat of the universe, I wonder if you could talk a little more on this point you just began on when have we decided on uh, in our growing up years um, if, if we don't help our children or ourselves learn to understand and validate our stories mm. and all of that, like, can you paint a picture of just how that shows up as adults? Um, like, as a teacher, like today, I think now my children are in 11th grade. And now I can see how it's showing up in their adolescent and their college yeah. behavior. It's not stuff I saw when they were in second grade. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a constant question we should hold as educators, that we're not actually going to see the impact of our work, because it's a generation long. Mm -hmm. um, so when I think about myself <laughs> growing up and how my life adversities, the lack of food I've gone through, the financial stability, instability I've experienced, I can see today when I'm 30 how that shows up for me. Um, and so I, I lead from there, mm. but I, th I think if you could talk a little more into, yes, there's resilience when you're faced with trouble because you, you need to get out of it. Um, and so it drives us uh, a lot when we're growing up in adversity. But I found myself struggling with my mental emotional health now as an adult and now beginning to try and unpack that. So it would be great to just yeah. hear some yeah. more perspective on <laughs> the mental health in adults. Thank you. Great question, Romana. Tarun, is it related or something with... Are there levels of stressors that we go through in our childhood uh, which cultivate <coughs> grit, which cultivate kind of our ability to kind of um, tide over challenges? And when does kind of, as teachers and educators, like when can we sense for uh, the zone of stressors moving into adversity? Like, mm. so one are obvious conditions, like say violence and conf being in conflict areas. But if you could kind of paint the picture of where does kind of grit end and where does it become overwhelming for a child and, and kind of goes in the zone of adversity. And like as educators and teachers, we have to be mindful of the fact that this has this is serious psychological, physical, emotional and long-term mental health uh, uh, kind of consequences uh, for children. So what are the different stressors and layers of uh, adversity? Romana, thank you for sharing your own story around that. Mm -hmm. And how does that show up as we become adults? Yeah. The, the most common stressors in childhood that lead on to these sorts of long-term problems are the sorts of stressors that stop development from going one step on top of another, on top of another. If, if we were to take a baby, say we take a six-month-old baby, we do not expect that baby to start running. It won't run round and round with its cot, you know? It will start moving its limbs, it will, it will start crawling, it will start walking, it will start running. It's got to go in that stepwise direction. Exactly the same is the same for emotions. Now, children learn emotions. If, if I am a five-year-old child and I'm having a relationship with an adult, an abusive relationship with an adult, who tells me that's a very special time this is a very loving time we're having. It's our special secret. You know, we, we know all these sorts of phrases that come out. I'm going to learn developmentally that sort of love, that sort of intimacy is about pain. So when developmentally, I should be learning to be safe, when I should be learning to trust adults, when I should be near to adults, that doesn't happen. And because development changes at different speeds at different times, we call those sensitive periods, I can't just do that later on as easily as I could at the time. 
And that's when the stressors really start damaging. And it, it's rather, it's like a, um, it's rather like a negative leapfrog. We, we heard about positive leapfrogging this morning. You also get this negative leapfrogging as well, because what happens is that when I'm three, I should learn something, emotionally, developmentally. When I'm four, I'm just not geared up to do that neurologically, so I can't just catch up. So the gap starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And for those of you that work with children who have seen a lot of adversity, you will see that gap getting bigger. As they get older through the school, the gap doesn't always close. It gets wider and wider. There are some parts of development, of neurological development, where the research is showing that sensitive periods, you know, you, you do different things at different times, are more serious and actually critical periods. So if you don't develop neurologically certain things like anxiety control, fight or flight type controls, it's really almost impossible to do it later on. And that's when we start talking about mental health problems. So I think in schools we need to start impacting on these issues. It's not just about education. These life skills can be called symptoms can be called mental health issues, depending where you are in the world. They're actually the same, they're the same things. Does that answer? And how yeah. does that show up as adults? Is that any? As, as, as adults, th there are statistics we know, things like children who are abused are nine times more likely than the average population to suffer psychosis. But it's, it's just proven time and time again. We know that in every country of the world, Mental health issues are very closely linked to these sorts of adversity issues in childhood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, for that. Thank you. Uh, I again want to acknowledge, one is the deferring views in this room. I, I appreciate uh, the voicing of that. And I also uh, recognize that we are looking at something from the deficit view. I'm not denying that. We are looking at problems. We are looking at barriers. Uh, so with that, we will close this session. And just to close the day on a different note, we are going to do something else. I'm going to invite Madhu for that. Uh, but to unpack the design again, really, I, this is how, how it was always planned to be. So I'm sure there are many of you who might be feeling this discomfort, who might be kind of, you know, why are we taking this type of view? So it was designed like that. and. Uh, we will change that tomorrow. OK. So let's uh, invite Madhu. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat>